Uh, Trent Deckard may be a little bit late, so I believe we should get started. Let me check with our, our TSD assistant. Um, Michelle, is everything ready to go? I believe so. I'm oh. promoting the uh, first presenter now. And I have okay. the slides all ready to go. Okay. Well, I'll begin with, with um, so a welcome and to everyone and some words about the Sophia Travis Grants program. You all have joined the special Zoom meeting of Monroe County Council's Sophia Travis Community Services Grants Committee for 2021. We are blessed in Monroe County with numerous community service organizations who have nonprofit status. This year, there are 38 applicant organizations requesting slightly more than $250,000 in grant support for their community service projects. The amount that the County Council has made available for 2021 grants is $135,400. So we again have considerable competition for grant funding. The County Council has generally increased the amount of grant funds that will be available in the following year when we develop the county budget, tying the small percentage of funding increases to the growth quotients set out by the state budget office. In future years, we may need to increase that percentage slightly if our revenue allows in order to fund grants at the level the council would wish. I want to say a few words about the Sophia Travis Grants Program. The Monroe County Council passed a resolution in 2008 to establish a fund from which to make grants to support various community projects. The original res resolution set out the purposes and intent of the fund. In 2013, the Monroe County Council adopted Resolution 2013-15 which renamed the Community Service Grant Program, the Sophia Travis Community Services Grant Program. Councilwoman Travis, who served on the council from 2004 to 2008, in consultation with numerous leaders and citizens of Monroe County, wrote and sponsored the original resolution creating the program in 2008. She worked tirelessly to improve the lives of all Monroe County residents. In the program, as it has evolved, there are now nine areas for grant support. Climate change, diversity, equity, and inclusion, emergency shortages, excellence in government, first responders, health, food, nutrition, security, and shelter, transportation assistance, veterans assistance, and youth enrichment opportunities. I think it's also valuable for the public to know there are five evaluation criteria. Programs must primarily serve Monroe County residents. Two, whether the dollar amount sought will likely accomplish the stated goal of the proposal. Three, whether the fund sought will leverage additional funds or assistance from other organizations. Four, support for basic operational expenses will be considered, but not given highest priority. Five, support for an organization's salaries will be considered, but also will not be given the highest priority. The committee reviewing the grant proposals for this year includes five members. Joshua Johnson is a community member, Ryan Boyce, is a community member. And there are three county council members, Trent Deckard, Kate Wiltz, and myself. Our committee will present their funding recommendations to the county council work session on July 27th, which is a public meeting beginning at 5.30 p.m. Applicants will not need to wait long to learn the council's decision on Sophia Travis grant funding for next year. Tonight's meeting plan is straightforward. Grant applicants will have three minutes to present. I will call out the names of the first three applicants to give 
their presentation and then announce the, the second group of three. Before the second group begins, I will announce the third group of three and so on. This has worked well in previous years to keep presentations moving along. The presentations we will hear tonight are being recorded by CATS and will be available to the public at a future date. This meeting and the CATS recording are good opportunities for the public to learn about the excellent works of many organizations and about the projects they are hoping to fund and carry out. Let's begin with all options, Gray Center and Community Kitchen in the first group of three, then WFHB, Courage to Change, and Lotus Education and Arts Foundation. Are we ready to begin, Ms. Dayton, with all options? Excellent. Well, everybody see that okay? Yes, looks good. Welcome all options. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Okay. I'm starting my own timer too. Oh, I, I apologize. Uh, just to interrupt, uh, terribly sorry. Um, I will also be doing the three minute timer. It'll be audio only. Um, there will be a, a tone that happens when you have 30 seconds left and then another tone again when your time is up, um, which will be this. Okay. All right, go ahead when you're ready. Very good. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is Jess Marchbank and I'm the center manager at All Options Pregnancy Resource Center. We have requested $4,500 from the Sophia Travis Social Services Grant Committee to purchase diapers and diaper cream for our Hoosier Diaper Program. Since 2015, we have provided a monthly supply of diapers to hundreds of local families. Early in 2020, we shifted our diaper distribution to a contact-free model, and we've opened our program to anyone in need. More recently, we've also been mobilizing volunteers to do contact-free diaper delivery to a handful of clients each week. Beyond diapers and wipes, we also provide menstrual products, condoms, pregnancy tests, and other essential items when requested. And recently, we've noticed a dramatic uptick in the number of families requesting diaper cream about 80% of families each week. These families need the continued support of the local community to keep their children clean, dry, and healthy. What is diaper need and why should we care about it? Um, even before COVID-19, diaper need was widespread and pervasive with one in three families reporting with struggling with diaper need. Diapers are not covered through existing social safety net programs like WIC or SNAP. And when a child lacks an adequate supply of diapers, too much time in the soiled diapers puts them at risk of severe diaper rash, bladder infections, and other things. Providing clean Marty, diapers. Can you get a chance? Can you give me a call tomorrow? Oh. Um, I Providing, want to talk to you about- I'm sorry, we've got a- We have an interruption. <laughs> that's going to be- Just a minute. Please, please go back to where you were interrupted. We're so sorry. It's okay. Uh, too much time in a dirty diaper puts children at risk of a lot of health complications and providing clean diapers can reduce the need for non-essential visits to the doctor, which is also critical for limiting exposure to germs and reducing the burden on healthcare providers at this time. While there are other organizations in Monroe County that do provide diapers, none are able to offer consistent access to diapers or the quantity or sizes that we do at all options. We are working within the latest public health guidelines to distribute diapers in as safe a manner as possible and minimize the transmission of germs. We've closed the center to the public and are using a contact-free distribution method, handing out packages of diapers and wipes every single week. <laughs> we know that something so seemingly small, a few packs of diapers, that can mean the difference between a child getting their needed rest for the night or wailing in discomfort between a healthy child and one who suffers from chronic infections that can also rack up copay and pres prescription costs. The simple act of providing diapers with all options, support and compassion has the capacity to change a person's life in a dramatic way. We're grateful and inspired by the way this community has stepped up to fund worthwhile social services. We appreciate your past support and your consideration of our request. Thank you. 
Thank you. Let's hear from Grace Center next. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. My name is Darren Eads. I'm the president of uh, Grace Center, Inc. Uh, on behalf of Grace Center, I want to thank the Monroe County Council for your time in this process. Uh, Grace Center received our 501c3 status back in March, on March 22nd of 2006. Uh, in September of 2006, uh, the Grace Center Food Pantry began serving the Clear Creek, Indian Creek, and Polk Townships in Southern Monroe County. Uh, the pantry is located in Harrodsburg, and we work from a small space serving approximately between 30 and 40 households every week. Uh, with, with the pandemic going on, we've seen that number kind of fluctuate a little bit, but, but it is, it, uh, we, we look forward to having everybody back and healthy here very soon. <laughs> Grace Center is committed to providing nutritious food to the southern area of Monroe County. This is a rural part of the county, faces some of the same issues as larger communities such as Bloomington and Bedford do. Uh, our neighbors we know by name and maybe by relation. Um, they, they fight food security each week and every week our volunteers talk with and assist clients receiving food from the pantry. Uh, the, the food pantry is uh, a client choice food pantry. Unfortunately with COVID, we have went to a no touch, no contact. Um, we just pre-bag the food and they pull up and it's a drive up delivery for them right now. Um, we look forward to being able to get back to the point where they can come in and do their own shopping. We feel like that's a more dignified way for them to be able to come and select the food that they want to eat. And, um, and we look forward to being able to get back to that uh, hopefully soon. Uh, food available in our pantry is accomplished either by monetary or food donations. These donations come from local church, clubs, organizations, and individuals through fundraising events and grants such as the Sophia Travis Community Service Grant. Uh, it is a goal to always strive to provide food that's considered nutritious. Uh, the first board members made a commitment early on to provide milk, eggs, and bread to every client on a weekly basis, and we do continue to do that as long as bread's available. And um, as we provide uh, meat, protein, dry and canned goods, and fresh produce uh, when possible. Um, you know, part of our, our mission at the Grace Center is also not just the food, but it's also uh, to promote some social interaction with a lot of our clients. And unfortunately, this past year and a half, it's been a challenge, but uh, each time when they pull up in the car to get their groceries, we still try to check in with them. And, and we know when they're not there, because we know we have a lot of regulars that come in every single week, and, and we, we try our best to be able to, to check in on them. Um, our COVID protocols are all still in place as they were last year and, and you know, we, we want to be sure to keep all of our volunteers and clients as safe as possible and we provide all the safety measures needed. Um, as we uh, continue to serve, we just want to um, say thank you for <clears throat> the council's consideration and uh, we've made the request for $3,000 again uh, for this year for the 2022 purchases and we do appreciate uh, your continued support and your consideration. Thanks. Thank you, Grace Center. Next, we'll hear from the Community Kitchen. Good evening. Um, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to be here again this evening. Um, as you know, at Community Kitchen, we are the largest, largest provider of free meals in the community, uh, providing warm and reheatable food to folks in need from three locations now. Um, and Last year, we were able to provide 256,374 meals and snacks. 50% of the folks we served were kids. Um, and it's sort of notable, I think, to make sure that you understand that that's the lowest percentage of children that we've served in probably the last six or seven years. Um, and it was primarily because a lot of the programs that we work through to reach out to children were closed for a good part of last year. So that reduced our numbers. But um, our request tonight is for $8,000 for food purchase. Uh, our food budget um, and basically where we are six months into the year, we expect to spend $150,000 to $160,000 this year on food alone. Um, it is our second largest expense after staff. And so we would appreciate your support for that. Um, I think one of the most notable things for us over the last year has just been our ability to remain open. Um, we were able to make it through the last uh, 16 months without having to be closed even one day. Um, our staff and volunteers were excellent at making the adjustments we needed to make to go to carry out style only for a while. Um, we went a few months last year without volunteers and then able, were able to welcome them back on a, on a very limited basis. We were finally able to open our dining room at the end of June, um, which we are very excited about. Um, as we reach the hotter parts of the summer, we're happy to, for folks to be able to sit down um, in a more dignified place and eat at a table 
uh, with other folks um, in a, an atmosphere that's much more um, conducive to eating dinner than sitting outside in the hot sun. And so we're really happy about that. Um, <clears throat> that's really all I have to say. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and any support that you can give us will be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Community Kitchen. The next group of three to follow um, the next three presenters will be Amethyst House, Center Stone, and Big Brothers Big Sisters. Next, we'll hear from WFHB. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here with you all today. I'm Jar Turner. I'm the general manager of WFHB. Uh, I feel fortunate to be here and be considered for this opportunity. Uh, WFHB is seeking assistance from the Sophia Travis Grant Committee to expand our efforts of our mission, which is as follows. WFHB exists to provide an open forum for the exchange and discussion of ideas and issues and to celebrate and increase the local cultural diversity. WFHB seeks specific support to upgrade our remote broadcasting capabilities to continue this work fostering community connections in a changing radio landscape, um, specifically by meeting people where they are, uh, festival circuits, um, remote broadcasts, um, at, at, at fairs, uh, et cetera. Uh, WFHB is requesting $3,500 for funding to purchase the necessary equipment for high quality community-based broadcasting live on location. Uh, the gear that we need to enable us to do this uh, will transmit uh, audio through cellular service. So this will allow us to do remote broadcast or break in from a festival uh, table from any virtually any location. So it has a lot of promise for, um, for uh, uh, connecting with, with live events and, and with tourism. Uh, with the help of the Sophia Travis grant, we could acquire key, this, this, um, this key piece. Uh, we can leverage uh, funds currently reserved to buy some of the equipment. And we can also leverage this from our trained volunteer base who will be using the equipment um, to broadcast remotely. The COVID-19 pandemic temporarily halted all community events, festivals, and outdoor concerts. Uh, these events are important for our local culture, enhance our community connections, and highlight the diversity of our community. As things move toward a new normal, resuming these events will be vital in reestablishing our community connections. WFHB with our, our local community radio station can play a key role by partnering with festival organize, organizers uh, to broadcast live from these events. Um, live festivals and events could either be broadcast in their entire, entirety or be highlighted by correspondents in the field, uh, interviewing festival goers and organizers, capturing the en energy as it occurs. Uh, we hope you'll consider helping us to make this a very important update to our broadcasting capability. Your support could usher in a radio renaissance as we begin to come together to celebrate and boost Monroe County's local art and cultural events. Thank you, WFHB. Let's hear now from Courage to Change. Hi, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank you for allowing me this platform to speak. My name is Stacey Flynn, and I'm here tonight representing Courage to Change. We were founded in 2016 in order to provide affordable, sober living to men and women in the Monroe County area. Uh, and I serve as the house for the women facilities. Tonight, we are asking the Sophia Travis Committee for $4,000. This would be in order to continue to award rent scholarships in our solar program. You know, along with the struggle, students are also learning how to navigate through the criminal justice system. Oftentimes, these folks are coming into our program from and sometimes jail or prison. 
So they may have financial obligations already to be met in the form of court, attorney, and probation fees. Our residents already have many stressors when entering sober living, which are varied, but may include maintaining a hectic schedule, attending their required meetings, um, attending required appointments, along with finding gainful employment. that recently been through some difficult times in their lives, residents don't always have lots of support, especially financial support. Therefore, we are requesting this funding through our fresh order to somewhat alleviate the financial burdens they may be facing. One of our goals at Courage in sober living is to offer a safe and sober environment for folks to gain the stability, independence, and freedom from their addiction. With funding awarded from Sophia Travis, our residents have financial stability so that they may be given the opportunity. As house manager, I have been able to witness the gratitude expressed by folks when I am able to award this type of aid. Um, this also, um, and in supporting their journey and finding a better quality of life. And I would very much in close like for our organization to allow me to be a presenter tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Courage to Change. Uh, we had some audio difficulties during your presentation, and I'm so sorry that happened. But please know that we will not base any evaluation on the audio quality of, our, of Zoom, because all of us have experienced this kind of problem. Thanks again. Next, we'll hear from Lotus Education and Arts. Um, I have not been able to find their presenter in the list of attendees. Oh, I'm so sorry. We didn't, uh, we had lots of um, alternatives for when people could not present, but we did not hear from Lotus if Education and Arts. If they're here, perhaps uh, that person could raise their hand if they're listed. Um, oh, Tamara Lowenthal just raised her hand. There you go. Hi, sorry about that. <laughs> Hello, welcome. Yeah, we're using Tamara's account, but I'm actually, I'm, I'm Jill Campbell. I'm the uh, Community and Arts Engagement Director for the Lotus Education and Arts Foundation. Um, I'd like to thank the council for their consideration for this award. Um, so we are asking uh, for funding for one of many um, art education outreach um, initiatives that Lotus um, takes part in. Um, this is specifically for our Lanterns Remix project, which is a continuation of a, the Lanterns and Luminaria project of last year that focused on um, lantern traditions from Central South America and China. Um, we, this year, are focusing on lanterns inspired by Korean tradition um, with designs by the paper artist uh, Shelly Hamo Chan. Um, and the Lanterns Remix title comes from um, our future collaboration with the IU Arts and Humanities Council. Uh, since this year, their um, first Thursdays is going to be Korean, Korea Remixed. Um, we have already started uh, hosting workshops in the Fire Bay with Banneker Center and the Boys and Girls Club. Um, 68 kids have attended uh, masked and socially distanced um, workshops hosted by Amanda Hutchins, our Operations and Visual Arts Program Manager. Um, we also plan to host a table at Pride Fest. Uh, with Korean Lantern educational material and a Lantern activity that they can participate in. Um, at uh, two of our free events during the Lotus Festival in September, 
Um, we will have Shelley give a lecture and demo demonstration at the Arts Village um, and at Lotus in the Park, which both are free um, family friendly events um, during Friday and Saturday of the festival. Um, and this uh, eliminates the financial barrier for arts education that is um, the primary um, barrier for uh, arts education in South Central Indiana. Um, in November of 2021, this project uh, will conclude with a community lantern walk in downtown Bloomington. Um, this is to celebrate uh, South Korea's Seoul Lantern Festival and the St. Martin's Day Festival, which is a European lantern festival um, that, and they both uh, feature paper lanterns. Um, by focusing once again on um, Asian lantern traditions, um, Lotus hopes to inspire empathy through arts education um, during this time when there's increased aggression towards members of our Asian community. Um, I would like to thank the council for their consideration for this award today, and um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Lotus Education and Arts. Our next group of three will be Middleway House, Team First Book, and New Leaf, New Life. Now we'll turn to Amethyst House, Centerstone, and Big Brothers. Welcome, Amethyst House. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Hutchinson, and I'm speaking on behalf of Amethyst House, where I'm working as their Communications and Development Fellow. Amethyst House is a Bloomington-based nonprofit that provides substance use treatment. Amethyst has been a part of Bloomington for over 41 years, doing our part to support the recovery community. We are asking for $5,000 to help us purchase groceries for our residents. Our men's and women's facilities house up to 31 adults, with our women's program regularly housing pregnant women and women with infants and young children. Addictions treatment is an urgent need in our society, but it's also a forgotten one. Last Wednesday, July 14th, the CDC shared shocking statistics that reported U.S. drug overdo overdose deaths soared nearly 30% in 2020, while in Indiana there was a 33.1% increase in these heartbreaking deaths. This is the sharpest annual increase in the last three decades. Public health officials relate this escalation to a tragic result of a deadlier supply and the destabilizing effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. The treatment Amethyst House provides is more crucial than ever before. We've continued to adapt our program to the best of our ability to keep our residents safe throughout COVID-19, yet something that is consistent need throughout all of this is hunger. We need to feed our clients. As part of our treatment, we provide comprehensive support while our residents make positive changes in their lives starting from the ground up. Nutrition is essential for the healing that needs to happen for a person in recovery, both physically and mentally. In addiction, malnourishment often occurs because a person's well being takes a back seat to drugs and alcohol. We see clients who are at unhealthy weights, who have medical risks, or whose poor diet and lack of self care cost them their confidence. Early recovery is very critical time to identify behaviors that need to change. By teaching our clients independent living skills, including meal planning and healthy nutrition, we focus on sustainable well being. All of this will lead to long term recovery. Amethyst House is, a very, is very active in Bloomington, collaborating with other nonprofits like the Hoosier Hills Food Bank to organize food and other necessities. This helps relieve some of the costs from, gro from groceries, but we can't solely source our food assistance from food assistant programs and donors, especially as we try to maintain a well-balanced pantry. With an estimated total food cost of $84 per day for our two residences, $5,000 would provide our residences with food for 60 days. The Sophia Travis Community Service Grant will provide much needed assistance during these challenging times. On behalf of Amethyst House, thank you for considering our application. Thank you, Amethyst House. We'll hear next from Centerstone. Great, yes, hello. Um, my name is Missy Ramp. I'm the Assistant Manager of Supportive Houses Housing Services for Centerstone of Indiana. I manage the supportive housing locations across several counties, including Monroe County. Our department specifically caters to the needs of individuals with serious mental illness. Among the programs that I manage, three of them are my favorites, uh, Stepping Stones, 
and then the Hoosier House Group Home and Blair House Group Home. Some of you might be familiar with Stepping Stones, which caters to adolescents and youth age 16 to 20 who have been homeless, but our SGLs similarly cater to individuals who have experienced homelessness or otherwise have nowhere else to go. Our group homes cater to those who are adults age 18 and older. All three of the programs are designed for clients to stay for up to two years, designed to teach skills necessary to support clients to being able to eventually move into a more independent setting. Additionally, we provide services connecting them with different treatment, including medication monitoring, psychiatric medications, um, help getting into physical health treatment and benefits such as health insurance, SSI, SSD. So these are my favorites because all three of the locations are the most intense that we serve out of all of our center stone places. All three of them have staff available 24 seven. They go about doing things like groups, activities, meal prep, chores, games. Uh, the staff work individually with clients on their care plan goals, like getting a job, taking medications, or even keeping their rooms clean. That's for mm -hmm. adolescents and adults. So over the past year, our clients for Stepping Stones 100% come from homelessness. Our group home clients, 47% come from the state psychiatric hospitals where they have nowhere else to go. 35% are homeless, 12% come directly from jail, and 6% were actually discharged from a nursing home and otherwise homeless. Clients who are experiencing homelessness coming out of jail or even the state hospitals usually do not have any source of income. I have personally had to provide clients with used in, in order to support their hygiene needs or teach them how to stack up sheets in order to suffice for a winter blanket. We are requesting $6,000 from the Sophia Travis grant, which would allow us to provide welcome baskets to our new admissions that would provide things like hygiene items, bedding, pillows, COVID-19 supplies, and other identified needs such as clothing and food. Having these supplies upon a new program would really help set up our clients for success. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Stone. Next, we'll hear from Big Brothers Big Sisters. Hello, everyone. I am Tyler Garzinski from Big Brothers Big Sisters. Thank you all for the opportunity to present our grant to you all this evening. Big Brothers Big Sisters is requesting $15,978 to increase our one-to-one -one mentorship program with a renewed focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. As Big Brothers Big Sisters returns to a post-pandemic routine, COVID-19 revealed some challenges. The response to the pandemic may be amplifying some adverse childhood experiences or ACEs for short. There are several ways in which ACEs may be exasperated by stressors unleashed by this pandemic. The pandemic has increased family adversity by exposing children to increased parental anxieties such as job loss, food insecurity, and housing insecurity. Increased family adversity may impair childhood brain development, and the pandemic has disproportionately affected low-income and ethnic minority communities, which are already at increased risk for ACE-impacted conditions. These discoveries have revealed the need now more than ever for Big Brothers Big Sisters. With the requested funds, we hope to improve the already successful mentoring program we have by reflecting inclusive language and imagery from Monroe County's diverse community. We're creating a space for marginalized people to step forward and let their voices be heard. Big Brothers Big Sisters aims to create an embracing environment for all Monroe County citizens. Through our matching process, we connect at-risk, low-income youth to positive role models and mentors. Each child has potential that is worth defending regardless of their environment. Bigs receive training and guidance from Big Brothers Big Sisters to mentor their little. Recently, that guidance is focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, part of our DEI and LGBTQ plus initiatives. All of our staff is DEI trained as part of Big Brothers Big Sisters of America's JEDI focus, and this isn't just performative either. Big Brothers Big Sisters will continue to train the JEDI platform. Together, the bigs and littles can clear a path to success by breaking down societal barriers, 
closing opportunity gaps, and overcoming adversities like poverty and identity-based discrimination. The Center for Disease Control identifies us at Big Brothers Big Sisters as the best known example of one-to-one -one mentoring for youth that lessens the effects of ACEs, which disproportionately affect minority populations. I encourage you all to read the impactful study in our grant proposal. Big Brothers Big Sisters currently supports over 100 active matches in our community, but there are over 100 children currently on our wait list looking for a match. Since January, we have had a 30% increase in inquiries from Monroe County residents looking for a mentor. The increase to staff time, as well as long overdue improvements to office equipment, will help enable staff at Big Brothers Big Sisters to navigate the environment COVID-19 exposed to us. This will in turn make us serve all children, regardless of their background and demographic, to the fullest and provide the best opportunities for them to see true change in their community. Many of these activities require external software and support, which is necessary for us to make sure that we ignite the potential of all these children. Thank you all very much for your time. I know you got a difficult uh, job and I wanna wish best of luck to all the other nonprofits. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you, big brothers, big sisters. The next group of three uh, will be Midway Music Speaks, Sojourn House and Alexandra's Food Drive. We'll now hear from Middleway House. Whoops. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sam Udak. I'm the grants manager at Middleway House. Uh, we're requesting $4,687 to, to rekey our entire facility. Um, it's a big project. We have to do it every five or six years uh, for just basic security reasons. Um, as a nonprofit, you generally have a higher turnover rate of staff. Uh, we have people come in and out of the building over the years and enough keys go missing or they end up in a certain place or um, just people leave and forget to return them and they move to another state or something happens. So as, a, as just a general security measure, we have to rekey the building uh, every five or six years or so. Um, it costs $4,600 because Middleway House is a 30, occasionally 30 plus two bed shelter. Um, when demand dictates, we can convert some office space into bed space. Uh, in the current COVID conditions, we're, we tend to have something closer to 20 to 25 people at a time. Uh, we're restricted to one um, household per bedroom. Uh, so if a lot of, occasionally we'll have clients come in with children. Um, Usually at any given time, there's somewhere between 10 and 15 kids in shelter with the adults. Um, in addition to the emergency shelter, uh, which Middleway House does operate uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we have a crisis line that we operate for the same period of time. Uh, we serve anyone from any place, uh, any gender, age, doesn't matter. Um, we serve survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. In addition to the crisis line and the crisis shelter, we have advocates that will meet folks on scene. In the hospital, we have legal advocates that will work on protective orders with you, family law issues, whether you're filing for divorce or trying to uh, gain or retain custody of your children. Um, they will accompany you to a law enforcement interview. Um, in addition to that, we have a nationally accredited child daycare, uh, and then we run a transitional housing facility. Um, for longer term stays as people transition to long term safe housing. Um, other than that, I don't think we really have much to add. The project is fairly simple and straightforward. Um, we operate on an empowerment model and we help clients who are staying in shelter make decisions for themselves. And those decisions include uh, a safety plan. And it's always a personalized safety plan that works on, you know, uh, a safe environment in your home and a safe environment in your workplace. And in order to help people continue to make those safety plans and to set, for example, we have to run a secure facility ourselves and this project replacing dozens of locks and 301 keys is part of that. So thank you for your consideration. I really appreciate you all having us here today. And uh, the Sophia Travis Grant Project continues to be a, a, a vital part of community support. Thanks. Thank you, Middleway House. Let's hear now from Team First Book. Hi, I'm Patty Callison, uh, co-chair of Team First Book. Thank you all for having us here this evening. Uh, for more than a decade, Team First Book of Monroe County has worked toward advancing educational equity for children from low-income homes in Monroe County. 
Books and resources impact everything from psychological well being to academic performance. But kids in need don't have that advantage. Our mission is to fund new, high quality books to these children to own in their homes. Access to print media in the home has been shown to be an indicator of the overall academic success of students. Team First Book partners with Title I Schools and Monroe County Community School Corporation and Richland Bean Blossom Community School Corporation to provide books for the children from preschool through second grade, the optimal period to acquire language and reading skills. During the pandemic, funds from Sophia Travis Community Grants helped Team First Book provide books for area students. Since 2010, Team First Book has funded approximately 80,000 books to children in Title I schools, Monroe County United Ministries, Child Care, Head Start, and other programs. National First Book spearheads a program entitled Stories for All, which curates new relevant high quality books representing diverse characters, voices, and life circumstances and makes them available and affordable to educators supporting kids in need. Team First Book wishes to make the purchase of these books from the First Book Marketplace possible. The marketplace is able to offer drastically discounted books. We are asking for funding for two schools. Fairview Elementary and Highland Park Elementary of MCCSC, which would benefit greatly from the Stories for All initiative. Fairview's population, according to figures from the Indiana Department of Education, is nearly 46% children of color, and almost 86% of the population is economically disadvantaged. Highland Park's population is nearly 30% children of color, and almost 57% are economically disadvantaged. Team First Book is asking for funding of at least three books per child. The total for the children in, this prog in these programs would be $3,360. We hope you'll take a look at our request and help us provide books for kids in Monroe County. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Team First Book. Next to present is New Leaf, New Life. All right, hi everyone. <clears throat> My name is Jordan and I am here to represent New Leaf, New Life. Um, our small nonprofit assists individuals who are currently incarcerated or have been recently released from incarceration um, with their transition back into our community. We assist folks with a variety of resources, such as obtaining daily essential items like food, clothing, and hygiene supplies. Um, and we also help folks with obtaining treatment placement, housing, employment, education, um, and really any other resources or services that they may need. For this grant, we're requesting funding to help us purchase critical supplies, such as hand and feet warmers for the colder months for our clients that have been released, but they're still seeking housing. Um, vouchers for Uber um, to assist folks with transportation to and from probation meetings or, um, you know, job interviews, things like that. <clears throat> um, and our highest priority is funding to purchase money orders, which are needed to help folks obtain birth certificates. Um, and if you don't have your birth certificate, then you unfortunately can't get employment um, and you can't access your other identification documents like your social security card or an ID or things like that. Um, so that's a, a big uh, thing that we're often spending a lot of funding on is just really helping folks get their birth certificates. Um, so my presentation is just short and brief. Um, thank you guys for your time and for your consideration. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you, New Leaf, New Life. Uh, our next group of three will be Indiana Solar for All, Boys and Girls Clubs of Bloomington, and Beacon Incorporated. Our next presenter is Midway Music Speaks. 
Hello, thank you so much for having us here tonight. Uh, I'm Rachel Glego. I'm the current executive director at Midway Music Speaks. Uh, Midway is a nonprofit organization that celebrates and connects women identifying and non-binary people in music via promotion, empowerment, and performance opportunities and through a variety of programming every year. One of these programs specifically that's part of our education initiative is Girls Rock Bloomington, which is a summer camp for girls, trans, and non-binary youth. Uh, Girls Rock Bloomington is a week of music classes, giving campers the opportunity to learn mm -hmm. instruments, take workshops on the industry, uh, such as merch design, gear maintenance, et cetera, and participate in songwriting sessions with their bands that are created throughout the week. At the end of the week, the newly formed bands compete um, in, or sorry, excuse me, complete at least one song that's then performed in a showcase for the community. Uh, for most campers, this is their first time on stage in a band and even playing an instrument. Midway provides all of the gear for campers and young musicians to use, so no experience is required, and it lowers the financial barrier to participate as many can't afford their own instruments. To support this initiative, we also decrease the financial barriers um, by providing scholarships for campers in need. Due to COVID, this summer's programming has been a socially distanced weekly workshop series at Bryan Park's Woodland Shelter. Uh, workshops such as songwriting and composition, recording and radio, album art and press photos, running a record label, et cetera, have all been included uh, this year and will culminate in a final showcase performance on July 31st. You can follow the Girls Rock Bloomington Instagram for details or visit our website, midwaymusicspeaks.org for more info on that. Uh, beyond the camp, our camp directors developed a spinoff of Girls Rock uh, to youth year round, creating an after school series of programming and workshops for local area school children. This past year, we hosted a virtual songwriting and social justice club for girls, trans and non-binary youth ages eight through 18, or excuse me, eight through 14. And in addition, we hosted a songwriting circle for women, trans and non-binary adults. So we've expanded our education for lifelong learners as well. Um, it's important for us to increase our arts education and programming as arts and cultural opportunities are often the first budget line items to be removed during financial stress. So funds from this grant will go towards paying artists and helping to facilitate these educational opportunities and programs year round. Uh, thank you so much for your time and your continued support over the years and for your consideration for this year's Sophia Travis grant. Thank you. Thank you, Midway Music Speaks. Let's turn now to Sojourn House. Good evening. My name is Carissa Muncy. I'm a founding board member of Sojourn House. Our mission is to defend, restore, and liberate women who have been trafficked and exploited. From the very beginning, a residential program has been our top priority and continues to be so. But we are very excited to share that our model has expanded to include non-residential outreach and case management in the community. Women are offered pathways to healthcare, housing, education, and career development from right where she is. This summer, Sojourn House hired a full-time case manager to begin outreach in downtown Bloomington and collaborate with existing Monroe County resources to identify victims of trafficking and exploitation and to provide specialized care for this population. At the same time, renovation of the almost 12,000 square foot portion of our building continues. When completed, this 24 month residential program will allow each woman the time and support she needs to complete the hard work of healing and rebuilding. We are excited to report that the 2020 Sophia Travis Award allowed us to complete the renovations and equipping of our office and education spaces. More than 300 hours of community volunteer work were donated to the project. 825 hours of IU internships were completed in program planning, policy development, and research of best practices. Because of this impressive community support, Sojourn House was able to provide over 450 hours of education on trafficking and prevention in this region. Now that the space for community education and case management are well equipped, our focus must turn toward the ongoing renovations of the, of the residential facility. We are asking for $10,200 to complete several key components. 
This amount would allow for completion of kitchen renovations, initial bedroom furnishings, and laundry facilities. We are more confident than ever that with the combination of outstanding community volunteers and support from Monroe County, the residential heart of Sojourn House can welcome survivors of human trafficking into a new way of life. We thank you for your support and for your ongoing consideration. Thank you, Sojourn House. Welcome to Alexandra's Food Drive. Chairwoman, Mun Chairwoman Munson and honorable committee members, thank you for inviting us to speak this evening. My name is Alex. I'm the president of Alexander's Army, joined by two of my board members, Ella and Taylor. Alexander's Army is an all kid run nonprofit organization founded last year in response to the growing need to combat local hunger. Our primary mission is to collect non perishable food. However, we are much more than that. We provide valuable leadership experiences to all, all participants in the program. Our program recruits and trains children of Monroe County to conduct a food drive in their own neighborhood. With your help last year, we were able to make an amazing impact on our community. We registered over 50 participants to join our Army who knocked on more than 1,000 doors and raised 4,585 pounds of food for the Hoosier Hills Food Bank. We were joined by 20 community partners and together we had a direct impact on nearly 3,000 We accomplished all of this in the middle of a global pandemic without being able to conduct a full hands-on marketing campaign. With our board in place, our website now live, and a year of experience behind us, we are now expecting to triple our recruitment and therefore multiply our direct community impact. We are requesting $3,025 for capital expenses to allow us to manage our growth. These funds will also be used as leverage for, for additional funding. Your return in, in, so your return investment is increased. The equipment we seek to purchase is vital for the efficiency for, of our workflow as we continue to demonstrate that kids can make a difference. We encourage you to visit us online at alexandersarmy.org to learn more about our organization. There, you can also check out our tribute to Sophia Travis. Thanks again. Thank you again for your time and consideration. We look forward to partnering with you again this year. Kids, kids can, can make, make a difference. difference. Thank you, Alex, Lilla, Taylor, and Ella. You have a great army. Next, we'll hear uh, from a group that is Mother Hubbard's Cupboard, Planned Parenthood, and St. Vincent de Paul. Um, Mother Hubbard's Cupboard was not able to uh, be here tonight, and Trent Deckard is uh, stepping in to give their presentation. Now let us hear from Indiana Solar for All. Hello, everybody. And thank you very much for this opportunity to present. Um, Indiana Solar for All, um, our leadership team, um, whose names are on the cover slide, are all volunteers. Uh, we have worked together since 2018 to make solar accessible to low-income families and to reduce the county's reliance on fossil fuels. Solar for All is committed to social justice and in creating a livable planet. Uh, the program has enabled 25 households to go solar since 2018, three rounds of solar grants and installation assistance. These grants represent a, an investment of about $150,000 in installations for county residents. The funds came primarily from donations associated with the Solarize program. We are now reviewing applications for a fourth round of grants. And if you approve our funding request, the, uh, the money will purchase solar components for one or two families 
while we pay for six more. Each solar system um, in materials and consulting costs comes to about $6,000. A standard generated, a standard granted system will reduce or eliminate the household's electric bill, freeing up money for other family essentials and protecting the household from rate increases. It will produce electricity for 25 to 30 years under warranty and for many years after that. In addition, if we are awarded a Sophia Travis Community Services grant, it will help us diverse our diversify our funding sources so we can continue to serve the people of Monroe County when existing solar tax in incentives expire over the next couple of years. When they do, it will make solar less affordable for everybody, and that will predictably reduce solarized donations. To support fundraising, we ask for your help to pay for a promotional video uh, at $1,530 and marketing services at $1,000. Uh, this presentation has focused on increasing the financial stability of individual households, but that's not the whole story. The value that Solar for All provides the community includes installation training for recipients and program volunteers. By building up the technical knowledge base and providing visible examples of self-generated electrical energy, this program helps to lay a foundation for our local renewable energy transition. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Solar for All. Boys and Girls Clubs of Bloomington will present next. Good evening. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you guys tonight. I, my name is Leslie Absher. I'm the Resource Development Director for the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, Jeff Baldwin, our Executive Director, is on a much needed vacation in Wisconsin, but he sends his regards. So I'm happy to be with you and thank you so much for letting us present this evening. So we provide at the Boys and Girls Club after school and out of school time programming for school age kids ages six to 18. Uh, we serve about 600 kids a day pre-pandemic and, and about 2,500 kids a year before that. Obviously the, the pandemic uh, hit us pretty hard. Um, COVID-19 kept us closed for in-person programming for about six weeks, but we're very proud that we were able to open after that, not only for after school programming, for full day programming as well. We provided full day support for kids and families when the schools were virtual 100% and parents didn't have the ability to stay home with their kids. So um, we have been excited about what we've been able to do during COVID. We're following the Monroe County Health Department guidelines and the CDC about masking and distancing and um, things like that. And so we, we've been able to really provide great uh, services during this COVID time. And actually we've been ramping up those, those numbers as well. We've been able to continue to grow back to our pre-COVID numbers in the summer and then looking at growing again in the fall and the spring. Um, and as that was happening, we were becoming very optimistic and then we had a flood at the Lincoln Street Club. So that's what this funding is for tonight. Um, we were hit with the flood damage as many others were. Um, we sustained about 10 inches of flood damage uh, all through the bottom level of the Lincoln Street Club. The water came in from the streets, but it also came up from the toilets and up from the sinks and up through the drains. And so it contained sewage. And so not only did we have to dry out our building, but we obviously had to, to thoroughly clean our building as well uh, and make sure the air quality was safe and everything was safe for kids to go back in. Uh, thankfully, we only missed one day of services. We were able to pivot our services to the First United Methodist Church, um, but we are back into the Boys and Girls Club now. However, there's still pretty significant damages. Uh, we thought that we would have about $200,000 worth of damages. It's looking more like 300 or 350. So uh, all of our rooms have built-in cabinetry. All of that cabinetry has to be cut out. Actually, it's already been cut out, but it needs to be replaced. Um, we have to replace carpeting. We have to replace uh, all kinds of things in our building that were damaged due to the flood. So um, because of that, we are asking for help from the Sophia Travis Group to help us provide support for our cabinetry. So the cabinetry costs to fix and replace is roughly 30 to 35,000. And thankfully we're look, working with a local cabinet maker, Reiki Cabinet, to not necessarily replace all the cabinets, but just replace the parts that were damaged. So we, the money specifically from Sophia Travis is going to replace the cabinetry in the membership area, which is the most used cabinetry and the most important to the flow of our space and getting kids checked in and, and having volunteers come in. So we really need that cabinetry and that membership desk replaced, which will be about $10,000. So that's our request tonight. Thank you so much for your time and for all you guys do for the community 
community. We really appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Boys and Girls Club. Uh, let us hear now from uh, Beacon Incorporated and the Reverend Horace Gilmore is planning to present. Hi, everybody. Am I unmuted at this point? Yeah, it looks like I'm. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's good to good to talk to you, even though I feel like I can't see your faces, which is hard to present to, but uh, glad to be here. And thank you for having us. Um, Beacon is a, uh, a, a solutions-based anti-poverty organization that specializes in hunger and homelessness. And we're uh, respectfully requesting $15,000 for rent and utility assistance to support our COVID-19 homelessness prevention project. And uh, it's I think it's particularly important because even though the pandemic is uh, to some degree at least starting to fade, um, uh, the impact of the recession can last for uh, can last one uh, can last well into the future, and so we really need to keep that in mind that it's not going away, even though the disease is uh, is declining. Um, right now, um, the Census Bureau estimates that one in six households nationally are currently behind in rent, and one in four households are behind in rent in um, rental households in Indiana, twenty five percent. Um, I think one of the things that's also really powerful is the economic roundtable has told us that over the next four years, the, the, the COVID-19 recession is expected to cause chronic homelessness to increase 49% nationwide, almost 50%, and cause twice as much homelessness as the 2008 Great, Great Recession. And that I think it's really important to know that homelessness lags um, uh, the recession and um, I did in 2008 and actually homelessness peaked some three years after the recession was over. And so we're expecting a similar pattern here that, that uh, homelessness will continue to peak over the next several years because of the recession that we're now coming out of. So that's why rental assistance becomes really important. One of the things we know is that with proper financial assistance for people at risk of homelessness, that it can reduce uh, the chance of entering into a shelter by 76%. And so that's what we wanna do. Um, uh, support from you will help other funding sources. We're, we're uh, leveraging a number of different sources, including the Jack Hopkins Fund, CDBG funding, and, and funding from our donors all together to try and create enough funding to support 300 households with a $500 um, rent or utility assistance for those households. So, um, so uh, your grant will help get us to the point where we get all, where we're able to do 300 households. So thank you and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Beacon. Our upcoming group of three will be Wheeler Mission, Meals on Wheels, and Hoosiers Feeding the Hungry. The latter one, Hoosiers Feeding the Hungry, will be presented by Kate Wiltz, County Councilwoman and she's stepping in to help Hoosiers feeding the hungry who could not be here. Let us turn now to Mother Hubbard's Cupboard and a presentation by C Councilman Trent Deckard. Thank you very much. And I'll be <clears throat> reading a message from Sarah Cahelani, the Director of Development for Mother, Mother Hubbard's Cupboard, who thanks the committee for past support and the opportunity to ask for assistance tonight for their food pantry program. Their mission, are, she says, our mission is to increase access to healthy foods for all people in need in ways that cultivate dignity, self-sufficiency, and community. Our food pantry, nutrition education, garden education, tool share, and advocacy programs work together to meet people's immediate needs for food assistance while developing community that, that will help them increase their food security. The Hub is home to the largest food pantry in the region. And we're the largest partner agency of the Hoosier Hills Food Bank. The food pantry is still operating in COVID mode. We're offering boxes in our parking lot Tuesday through Thursday from 12 to 2 and 4 to 6 p.m. We'll be reopening the pantry mid-August with increased safety precautions, including a filtration system, hand sanitizer stations, plastic dividers for high traffic areas, and timed entry. 
The hub operates on the honor system, meaning that patrons don't need to bring ID or proof of needs in order to shop. We just ask patrons to meet at least, at least one of our guidelines. We prioritize healthy whole foods such as fresh produce, bread, meat, and dairy products. And patrons are welcome to shop once a week with no cutoff date. Every week, the Herbs Hub, pardon me, serves approximately 3,800 people. 80% of patrons are Monroe County residents. And last year, they distributed over 1 million pounds of food. Our program helps families stretch limited resources and access healthy foods so they don't fall victim to the poor health outcomes that often plague folks living in poverty. 98% of patrons share that their families experience, experience less hunger and eat healthier foods because of the hub. In 2019, the last time they were able to, we were able to complete a patron survey, 41% survey, of our patrons report full-time employment. However, in Monroe County, the estimated wage for self-sufficiency for a single parent with one child is $20.44 an hour, a stark difference from the minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. Mm -hmm. And according to Feeding America, in Monroe County, the average cost of a meal is $3.09 per meal. At three meals per day, this adds up to $9.27, or 17% of the gross daily wage of an individual working a minimum wage job. MHC cannot change these economic challenges, but they can provide relief from having to make painful decisions of paying bills or buying food. And with the support of this committee, Mother Hubbard's Cupboard will be able to help thousands of people make ends meet and have access to healthy foods. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Planned Parenthood. Hi everyone, my name is Stephen Conrad and I'm here on behalf of Planned Parenthood. Our mission is to advocate, educate, and provide exceptional health care supporting sexual health, wellness, and reproductive freedom without judgment, without fear, without fail. Our clinic at Second and College provides the full spectrum of sexual and reproductive health care and our doors are open to everyone in need, no matter who they are, who they love, or how much money they make. Planned Parenthood is requesting $7,500, which will support our ability to provide safety net services for folks who could otherwise not afford their preventive health care needs. Despite the many challenges COVID-19 presented, we were able to implement new safety protocols and telehealth services, and we served over 2,700 unduplicated patients last year. Of those patients, 38% reported incomes at or below the federal poverty level, and 61% were either uninsured or on Medicaid or underinsured. Um, by underinsured, I just mean their deductible is unaffordably high and a barrier to care without financial assistance. Over the past year, we were able to leverage grants and donations, which allowed us to provide almost $54,000 in discounted services for patients who couldn't otherwise afford care. Um, in total, we helped 961 patients access or maintain their birth control of choice last year. We helped 745 patients access HIV, STI testing, treatment and or prevention. And we helped 224 patients obtain a wellness or cancer screening, which led to the early detection and treatment of cervical cancer for 28 patients. Um, the grant funding we're requesting this year will again be used to help patients access those same preventive health services, birth control, HIV, STI care, wellness checks, cancer screenings. Um, providing equitable access to sexual and reproductive health care is vital for Monroe County to achieve long-term health and economic equity. Indiana remains 12th highest in the nation for teen birth and unintended pregnancy rates are almost six times higher for people who are living below the federal poverty level. We know through decades of research that family planning can break and trench cycles of generational poverty and people who can plan their pregnancies are significantly more likely to complete high school, pursue and complete higher education, participate in the workforce, establish stable and supportive relationships and achieve or maintain economic stability. Uh, furthermore, Monroe County is trending higher than both the state and national average STI rates. And this is at a time where nationally syphilis, gonorrhea and chlamydia have reached levels higher than ever before reported to the CDC. Um, if left undetected or untreated, HIV and other STIs can lead to AIDS, cancer, pelvic inflammatory disease, infertility, ectomic pregnancy, chronic pain, liver inflammation, all sorts of horrible physical and mental health complications. Um, it is essential that Planned Parenthood can sustain the sexual and reproductive health safety net to ensure all people in Monroe County can achieve their family planning, health, social, and economic goals. We're so thankful for support from programs like Sophia Travis, without which we would not be able to meet the public need for low to no cost sexual and reproductive health care. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Planned Parenthood. St. Vincent de Paul will present next. Hello, I'm, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. So I'm Scott Alber and I'm president of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul in Bloomington, Indiana. And we're an all volunteer organization. We serve those in need. We help low and no income households with short term financial aid. And we also collect and distribute furniture and appliances. And on average, our furniture operations distributes over 5,000 pieces of furniture a year and over 200 appliances. One of the highest demand items we have is for dressers. And I just ran the numbers for the first half of this calendar year. We distributed 240 dressers, but we had requests for 355. So in other words, we were short 115 dressers. Now, a solution we came up with was, uh, and that's partially a result when our donations dropped off from COVID, is to purchase plastic dressers uh, from Walmart or Target. We could get these on average at $33 a piece because a lot of the dressers that we couldn't provide are for uh, families with small children. So what we've come up with or what we're requesting from the Sophia Travis uh, community service grant is $6,600, which would allow us to purchase 200 of these dressers. And the demand for these kind of dressers is even higher now that we've had the flood because we're part of COAD and we've got, uh, as you know, 170 households that were flooded out. And the ones we're really concentrated on are about 30 that uh, folks that lost not their apartments and the, they were so badly damaged they uh, won't be able to return and they of course lost all their furniture too as a result. So we're working with, with Salvation Army and the Red Cross to get those folks uh, when they get housing to be able to supply them with beds. We also got a grant from Tricapa to buy twin beds and this would be a wonderful complement to uh, supply dressers along with those beds. So this would be for children 12 and under. And if I can start my video here, yeah, if you can see me, I brought one of these plastic dressers here, so you can see how, how they are. And the other nice thing about these dressers is the fact that I can lift them because with COVID, we just now drop the items off in front of people's houses. And so even a single mom can grab one of these dressers and bring them in. So anyway, that uh, we we would ask for whatever amount that you can give us. That'll be the amount of dressers we buy. And we certainly are very uh, exceedingly thankful for all the help you've given us in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you, St. Vincent de Paul. Our next group of three will be Area 10, then Monroe County United Ministries, followed by Hotels for Hope. Now let us hear from Wheeler Mission. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Well, first of all, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to present. And thank you for all of your previous support to Wheeler Mission. Um, I am presenting on behalf of Wheeler Mission out of our Indianapolis office. And uh, Dana Jones, our area director, is on a well-deserved vacation. So I'm going to be filling in for him here today. But Wheeler Mission has been serving Bloomington since 2015 by providing Christ-centered programs and services for the homeless and those in need. And uh, so far this year through the month of June, we're serving an average of 210 meals each day to an average of roughly 78 guests each, each night. Um, and here recently, uh, there was a regional plan that was issued called Heading Home 2021 that was uh, conducted in, uh, in partnership with the United Way of Monroe County, the Community Foundation, South Central Housing Network, and the Housing Insecurity Working Group. And the goal was to make homelessness rare, brief, and non-repeating. And the first goal um, includes making homelessness rare and includes investing in strategies to prevent homelessness. And one of the strategies pursued uh, and one of the objectives listed is to utilize diversion, which is a uh, program or a project that has been pursued in other cities around the country, but is relatively new. Uh, to uh, central Indiana and south central Indiana. Uh, 
Um, essentially, it's to help people who are seeking shelter identify immediate alternative housing arrangements, and if needed, to connect them with services and financial assistance to help them return to housing. And with Wheeler Mission being in the position that it's in, as being often the front door to homelessness to many individuals who are seeking shelter in Monroe County, we feel like we're uniquely positioned to, to pursue uh, shelter diversion in Monroe County. And in fact, we recently uh, issued a pilot project here in Indianapolis in our Center for Women and Children to pursue diversion in 2019. And while the pandemic certainly got in the way of some of that, we have seen some, uh, some incredible success with that program. Uh, so all of that to say that we are, we are uh, requesting $6,500 from the Sophia Travis Community Services Grant Program to provide uh, shelter diversion uh, to individuals or households seeking shelter in Monroe County. Um, you know, many who enter a shelter uh, and into the homeless response system are often not in need of long-term programming or supportive housing program. And so it, we will do our best to, to identify those who are in position to stabilize if uh, they're able to receive a little extra assistance. And so uh, any support that we can receive from the council will be beneficial in that, in that way. Thank you for your time and thank you for the opportunity to present to the council. Thank you, Wheeler Mission. Meals on Wheels will present next. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good evening. My name is Janelle Udaly and I'm currently the chair uh, of our Meals on Wheels Board of Directors. We were founded in 1973 and we provide medically tailored meals to individuals who cannot prepare them for themselves for various reasons. Our volunteers deliver two meals per day, Monday through Friday, and we currently serve 96 customers using 300 dedicated volunteers. We are asking for $6,414 to establish an, and operate a pilot program called Groceries to Go for one year. Groceries to Go is designed to address food insecurity for low income individuals. The pilot program will start with our current Meals on Wheels clients and it will supplement the prepared meals that they receive Monday through Friday. Once the program is established, we intend to expand the availability to low income Bloomington residents who do not have access to other food sources due to health issues. The groceries uh, will be received from Hoosier Hills Food Bank, prepared for delivery and delivered by our volunteers once per week. We will contribute a shared maintenance fee to the food bank of 18 cents per pound to uh, cover the uh, shared expenses as well as transporting and warehousing. As this is a new program, there are some costs that um, we're gonna have to cover. We need to purchase a large refrigerator, three rolling storage racks, a preparation table, and the coolers that are gonna be needed to transport these groceries. We will have some staff time for volunteer recruitment, training, and also client outreach. These are one-time expenses and will not be needed annually to maintain the program. We anticipate approximately 20 Meals on Wheels clients initially will be in our program. And within two months, our goal is to open that up to an additional 20 uh, outside clients for groceries to go. Uh, we will engage an additional 10 weekly volunteers to operate the program, including a program supervisor who will handle food ordering, data tracking, and manage the volunteers. Throughout the program, um, we will continue to survey our clients to measure the success and if we are in fact meeting uh, their uh, low income nutritional needs. On behalf of Meals on Wheels, I uh, thank you for your consideration and uh, the continued support that you have provided us throughout uh, the years. Thank you. Thank you, Meals on Wheels. Councilmember Kate Wilt will present next for Hoosiers Feeding the Hungry. Okay, I will uh, read their prepared statement. According to Feeding America, approximately 20,500 Indiana residents regularly struggle with food insecurity, 4,000 of which are children. More than ever, families are struggling to buy groceries. 
food banks, pantries, and soup kitchens continue to work to protect the most vulnerable and underserved in our communities during these uncertain times. Sometimes getting groceries at local food banks and pantries is the only way to guarantee healthy meals or meals at all for many individuals and families when they need extra help. Hoosiers Feeding the Hungry encourages hunters and farmers to donate large game and livestock to our Meet the Need initiative. To donate, farmers and hunters just need to take their livestock or deer to local participating meat processors. They must call ahead to schedule livestock. After processing, local food banks and pantries are called to pick up the donation. Hoosiers Feeding the Hungry pays all processing fees on these donations so that there is absolutely no cost to the donors. We all also work within the 4-H community and get quite a lot of our livestock through the 4-H fair auctions. In some areas, we even have 4-H members who will raise money on their own to buy the animals and then donate them. We encourage the food banks and pantries that we serve to help themselves. They can speak to the local farmers, hunters, and 4-H in, the, in their community. This is a great way to get donations and spread awareness while building partnerships. Another great part of this program is that donors can even direct where their donation goes. They would just need to tell the meat processor what hunger relief agencies that they want their donation to be given to when dropping it off. Meat processors that have helped us get meat into Monroe County include Rice's Quality Meats, Pullman's Meat Processing, and The Deer Shop. Agencies receiving meat include Hannah's House, Wheeler Mission, Community Kitchen of Monroe County, Campus Kitchen at IU, Grace Food Pantry, Monroe County United Ministries, Mother Hubbard's Cupboard, and Saul to Paul. Monroe County has received almost 30,000 pounds over the last few years, providing over 110,000 meals. This program aids in averting hunger among those served by agencies receiving donations, which also boosts disposable income among those individuals because they can spend less money on food. This effort also allows those struggling to try and gain ground towards financial stability. Additionally, Health is improved due to the nutritional quality of meals provided. Statewide, over the last 10 years, we have paid to process over 1.9 million pounds of meat, providing over 7.6 million meals. I have one more sentence, two more, one more sentence. Our request for $5,000 will pay for the processing of approximately 4,000 pounds of donated large game and livestock, providing over 16,000 more meals to combat food insecurity in Monroe County. Thank you, Hoosiers Feeding the Hungry. The next group of three will be Hoosier Hills Food Bank, Community Justice and Mediation Center, and Counseling Services. Next, we will hear from Area 10, Agency on Aging. Good evening, I'm Chris Myers with Area 10, Agency on Aging. Thank you for taking the time to consider our proposal and for all of your work to support these important community projects. In June, 2019, we opened Enright East Active Living Community Center at the College Mall in response to years of older adults in Bloomington and Monroe County asking for a downtown senior center. Area 10 has operated a senior community center on the west side at our Ellettsville location for 21 years, but many people on the east side of the county had not found that convenient. Area 10 partners with the City of Bloomington Parks and Rec Department, along with support from IU Health Alzheimer's Resource Service, and the Commission on Aging to operate the center two days a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays from 11 to 3. The grant from the city pays for the rent, phone, and one part-time staff person coordinating the space. Area 10 provides all the staffing and support for program planning, scheduling, and direct programs. Through March 2020, Enright East was a resounding success with over 500 people regularly coming and considered members. There is no fee for becoming a member. With the pandemic, we shifted to entirely virtual support, including checking in with everyone weekly and then monthly to be sure people had what they needed and to assist those interested in connecting virtually to classes and social gatherings. In May 2021, we reopened the center in a deliberate scheduled way and people have been so happy to be coming back. 
We take all safety precautions, including continuing to require masks and limit total participants to 20 time. The space is welcoming with seating areas, tables with ongoing puzzles or games, plus space for programs like watercolor painting, Tai Chi, laughter yoga, regular chair yoga, and our popular evidence-based balance class all take place. This month, we opened the congregate meal program for a lunch time where individuals 60 and older can have a free nutritious meal as well as social gathering. Books, poetry, book groups, poetry discussions, presentations on nutrition and health, as well as all kinds of topics initiated by participants occur regularly. The dementia-friendly choir, Sing for Joy, is hosted in this space and eagerly hoping to return later this year. We also started a tech help program as well as loaner devices to connect older adults to each other, family, and friends. Endright East offers Monroe County older adults the space to maintain a healthy quality of life through physical and mental engagement. Since the beginning, Endright East participants have asked to be open more than two days a week. The fixed costs are already covered the entire year thanks to the city. We're asking for your support to expand our operations to three days a week by covering the variable costs of the hourly on-site staff person for one more day a week. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Area 10. Monroe County United Ministries will present next. Uh, I have not been able to find their presenter in the attendees list. Oh. If whoever is presenting could raise their hand, it would make it a lot easier. Hopefully we have a presenter there. It's Miss Katie Broadfoot. Uh, got me? Yep, can, can you hear me? You? Okay, yes. sweet. sorry. Um, actually, I'm Mary Jean. Uh, thank you so much for having us here this evening. My name is Mary Jean. I'm the Development Director at Monroe County United Ministries, affectionately called MACM. MACM strives to create lasting solutions to economic, educational, and social injustices in our community through quality services, collaboration, and innovation. We serve Monroe County's low-income population through two programs, our Compass Early Learning Center and the Self-Sufficiency Center. Over the past 83 years, MACM has provided high-quality, affordable childcare and self-sufficiency assistance to households experiencing financial instability. Monroe County has one of the highest rates of poverty in Indiana, with almost a quarter of the people in our community struggling to make ends meet. Throughout 2021, we have seen an uptick in community members seeking assistance. We are averaging 64 new families a month and expect that to grow in the continuation of the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition to the usual barriers faced by our clients, this global crisis has disproportionately affected their livelihoods. Our neighbors are truly struggling to keep up with rent and utility bills, as many who are in the service industry have been furloughed or terminated from their positions. Funding from Sophia Travis would enable us to serve more families who are facing an unexpected financial strain due to this epidemic. We are requesting $5,500 through the Sophia Travis Community Service Grant for our financial assistance aid fund. This fund is designed to help Monroe County families remain in their own homes, with their lights on, during a short-term period of financial instability, like a sudden layoff, medical emergency, et cetera. Unfortunately, Monroe County United Ministries does not always have the funding to support every request for financial assistance, but by working closely with other agencies, local governments, the faith community, and our township trustees, we strive to come up with the resources necessary and interventions to support each household in need. To underline the importance of this story, for this funding, I'll leave you with a client story. Last spring, a client came in looking for help paying his rent. He had lost his job just prior to the pandemic and with everything shutting down, he was unable to find employment. This created a situation where he was unable to pay his bills and fell behind on his rent. After a visit with one of our coaches, we were able to help him cover a month of his past due rent and get him in contact with other agencies to cover the remaining months and bills due. Within two weeks, we had pieced together his entire balance. Directed us again to let us know that he had been able to secure a job and was unbelievably grateful for Macam's help, as he truly had thought he was going to end up homeless during the pandemic. Thank you all so much for your time and past support and attention this evening. Thank you, Macam. Let us hear now from Hotels for Hope. <sighs> Hey, 
Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Lindsay Dominguez. I'm a co-founder and the director of operations at Hotels for Hope, um, who many people probably still know as Hotels for Homeless or H4H. Um, we recently incorporated with our new name, so that's what's going on with the name differences right now. Um, we are a small nonprofit org organization serving Bloomington and Monroe County. H4H provides low barrier housing first services to community members experiencing homelessness. Our primary focus is providing hostel, hotel stays for individuals and families experiencing homeless, homelessness while connecting participants with vital wraparound services to get back on their feet and into stable housing of their own. We are seeking $5,000 to pay rent um, for an office space to better serve our community and further remove barriers experienced by our clients. A place where we can begin to conduct in-person meetings with current past and potential clients, hold staff and volunteer meetings, and just a nice safe space to carry out the day-to-day -day managerial tasks of running a nonprofit. Um, since March, 2020, our directors, staff and volunteers have worked out of their own homes and conducted phone and Zoom meetings but it is difficult to really connect and assist someone um, with, for example, like a housing application or a job search without being right next to them. So we've signed the lease and are starting to move into a wonderful little space on South Walnut that's near other social services. Um, it's very close, walkable to several encampments. Um, it's accessible by bus or bike or car. And we're really just excited to start this new post-COVID um, chapter of our program. So H4H has, as of today, helped 110 people transition out of homelessness and into stable living situations of their own. It was actually um, a family of five, two adults and three children, um, just got into their new apartments today. So um, that bumped us up to 110. And we are currently serving nine people in the hotel. That includes five children one older gentleman with disabilities, and three people escaping domestic violence situations. Um, we have quite a diverse clientele. Um, we are really looking forward to seeing how having an office space can both transform and help us sustain this program with the help of the Sophia Travis grant. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Hotels for Hope. Our next group of three will be the Monroe County Humane Association, Indiana Recovery Alliance, and New Hope for Families. Our next presenter will be Hoosier Hills Food Bank. Good evening. I'm Julio Alonso, Executive Director at Hoosier Hills Food Bank, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to present this evening and all of your past support as well. Um, our request this year is a, a fairly straightforward one. We are seeking funds for purchasing food to distribute to our partner agencies in Monroe County. The pandemic had a pretty significant impact on us last year. Uh, we moved from distributing about 5 million pounds of food uh, over in 2019 to 7 million, over 7 million pounds of food in 2020. And it also turned our normal operating system on its head. Normally, we rely heavily on donated food from a lot of different sources and have a very small food purchasing budget of around $90,000. Last year, that purchasing budget rose to over $1.1 million uh, mm -hmm. as many of our uh, regular food do donation sources kind of dried up on us. Food drives, restaurant pickups of prepared food, retail donations, um, a lot of that stuff either went away or, or decreased significantly at the same time that need was increasing uh, very significantly. Um, so far this year, we've spent about $400,000 on food. We don't expect to, to be able to uh, meet last year's uh, numbers because there, there's just not quite that support there. And um, we're also hopeful that we're starting to see demand uh, ebb a little bit. Uh, but as you know, we're not out of the pandemic yet. And although we are starting to see some hopeful signs and some of our uh, food donation sources are starting to come back, the levels of need are still very high and food donations are not back where they, they were. 
We're committed to supporting our partner agencies and our neighbors for as long as recovery takes and beyond, because we do have to remember that even before the pandemic, we had unfortunately some, some fairly high levels of food insecurity um, in our community. And we, uh, we intend to, to reverse that trend and keep getting as much food out to the community as possible with your support. So we appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Hoosier Hills Food Bank. We're ready to hear now from the Community Justice and Mediation Center. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Grinette with uh, Community Justice and Mediation Center. Thanks for your commi uh, continued commitment to supporting Sophia Trappa's funding. And I really believe our community is better from the wide range of programming that the funds support. The mission of CJAM is to promote a civil and just community through mediation, education, facilitation, and restorative justice. We envision a fair community that learns from conflict, prevents harm, and grows in understanding. We're requesting $3,525 to fund training scholarships and stipends for 40-hour mediation and restorative justice training and for funds for program and volunteer outreach materials. Since the beginning of this year, CJAM has seen a 214% increase of requests for all of our mediation services and a staggering 384% increase in eviction mediation cases. At the beginning of June, we had already served 266 eviction cases, and this is during the moratorium. At the same time, our medi volunteer mediator, mediator roster shrank by 50% due to our capacity to train mediators, additional demands on current volunteers due to COVID, and for those volunteers who were unable to transition to virtual mediation. We are especially in need of mediators who have day hours available to serve as mediators during eviction and small claims court each week on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. These scholarships are extremely important as we normally offer partial scholarships to over 60 to 70 percent of our trainees. Over the next year, we also want to offer stipends for those who might need assistance with things like childcare, transportation, or other special needs in order to eliminate any barriers for participating in the training. In the new Heading Home Strategic Plan that you just heard about from Wheeler, Strate Strategy 3, Objective 4 recommends initiating practices to assist households in preventing homelessness by providing access to free legal and mediation services to tenants with a pending or active court case. Our ability to provide these services each week is directly related to our efforts to recruit and effectively train a diverse group of mediators that reflect those whom we serve. Thought I would end with sharing a couple of comments from two trainees that were supported by Sophia Travis scholarships this past winter. I appreciated the knowledge and practice provided on how to evaluate the needs and interests of those experiencing conflict and applying them as criteria for problem solving. I see great value in this approach when applied to mediation and other relationships in life. I also appreciated the range of age, race, gender that participated. It felt like a wide variety of voices were able to reflect on the material. And right now in our society, there's intense pressure to know the truth, have an opinion and voice it loudly. This training has encouraged me that it's okay to try to stay open, curious, which might allow deeper truths and unforeseen, but better options to appear. Thank you. Thank you, CJAM, as you're often called. <laughs> uh, our next presenter is Counseling Services uh, from Catholic Charities. Good evening. My name is Michael Stribling, and I am the Clinical Director of Catholic Charities Bloomington, also known as CCB Counseling Services. Thank you for the opportunity to present our proposal to the Council tonight. The mission of Catholic Charities Bloomington is to serve individuals, couples, and families by increasing accessibility to quality mental health care in our community. In fiscal year 2020, CCB served 711 individual clients, 81% of which were Monroe County residents. This past year, we provided our highest number of sessions yet as an agency at 9,147. The pandemic has increased the number of inquiries and requests for services, and we receive for all adults, families, and children across our community. 
The central focus of these inquiries are members of the community seeking mental health support while facing the various traumatic experiences people have experienced directly related to COVID-19, as well as other unrelated life challenges and concerns. One of the most effective therapeutic modalities for treating trauma across the lifespan is EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. EMDR works with the brain to heal itself by coordinating its natural processes to process negative experiences from a highly intense emotional state in the brain and body to a more adapted and the less emotionally charged state of being. Sometimes experiences become stuck in the emotional side of the brain, and this impacts how humans cope in their day-to-day -day life. While mostly associated with the treatment of PTSD, EMDR helps heal other issues, including anxiety disorders, depression, and panic disorders, with a trauma-informed focus that is safe to use with clients of all ages. Due to the effectiveness and speed of EMDR treatment, our agency's focus on trauma work with adults and families have made this cutting edge technique a focal point in our treatment model. And we believe it is important for all CCB staff to be trained EMDR providers. We would like to request $3,190 from the Sophia Travis Community Service Grants Program to pay for EMDR trauma treatment training for our two new therapists. This would align with our goal of all CCB therapists being fully trained in EMDR therapy creating a web of support throughout our agency that fulfills our mission to provide high quality mental health service to Monroe County residents. CCB will contribute the cost of transportation and lodging over the course of the five day intensive training in Lexington, Lexington Kentucky. Additionally, we've been able to hire a teen specialist to work with our rising number of adolescent clients and we request support through this grant to purchase a laptop for use with our ever expanding telehealth model. During COVID-19, telehealth and EMDR worked seamlessly with each other, providing consistent trauma treatment for our clients. And thanks to the speed with which EMDR can address the symptoms of trauma, clients finish their course of treatment and feel better faster, which in turn opens up our capacity to serve new clients in need. By funding both the EMDR training and helping us purchase a laptop, the Monroe County Council will support the continued expansion of mental health treatment services in Monroe County in a time where the demand for services is consistently increasing with no signs of slowing down. We appreciate your past support and thank you for considering our request. Thank you, CCB Counseling Services. Uh, our upcoming group of three will be Susie's Place, Writing for a Change, and South Central Community Action Program. Presenting next is Monroe County Humane Association. Hello, my name is Rebecca Warren, Executive Director for the Monroe County Humane Association. MCHA is a local 501c3 nonprofit operation. We have a facility on the far west side of Monroe County where we operate a full service nonprofit veterinary clinic and outreach center. Our services include accessible veterinary care, provided on a sliding scale basis, a free pet food and resource pantry, emergency housing and boarding for dogs and cats for owners in emergent situations, as well as training and education. Our direct service programs are focused at creating opportunities that support a lifelong pet and ownership bond. On behalf of MCHA, we're requesting a grant of $10,000 from the Sophia Travis Community Grant Program. These funds would be directly matched dollar for dollar from a private community donor already committed to helping us purchase a secondary vehicle. Over the previous five years, our programs have seen enormous growth. In 2015, we purchased our first vehicle and worked with this same donor to be able to buy a vehicle that would allow us to do mobile veterinary wellness clinics. They've come on board again and are willing to help us buy a second vehicle. Uh, the funds from Sophia Travis would be uh, matched for that for us to be able to do that. For that vehicle, we would be providing um, mobile veterinary clinics. Those mobile veterinary clinics have become so popular that we're forced to cap the number of animals that we can see at each clinic. And the demand for clinics also challenges the amount of equipment and supplies that we can safely bring in the current vehicle that we have. We're also regularly moving dog and cat food and supply donations across the community to other community care partners in Monroe County. Just this year, we've donated back over a thousand pounds of pet supplies to other area service organizations, rescue or shelters in Monroe County. We're working with other service providers to provide services to owners who are currently experiencing homelessness. We go into these communities directly, passing out free flea prevention, pet food, and other guidance on how to best care for their pets in those situations. As all of these services have continued to grow, we see the need to have more than one vehicle to be able to continue to distribute all the supplies. As the programs continue to grow, facilitating animal transportation to the clinic for services 
continues to become a consistent unmet need for owners that don't have transportation for themselves and their pet to the clinic. While we're coordinating care for owners, if they don't have transportation for themselves, then we can't always get their pet to the clinic. The second vehicle will allow us to grow those services for our Monroe County residents. We aim to use the funds from the Sophia Travis to leverage the matching grant towards uh, the purchase of a larger and second vehicle. This vehicle will allow us to transport the donated supplies to MCHA and back to other services providers. We will also be able to coordinate pet transportation for homebound owners that can't or owners who are currently experiencing homelessness getting their pets to the clinic. Um, additionally, we'll be able to do uh, larger food transportations and other pieces. Uh, I believe based on the Sophia Travis grant criteria, based on their services, we'll be providing Monroe County residents to the ca capacity of transportation, emergency services, emergency shortages, and specific to health and security. Thank you for considering our opportunity for expanding our transportation opportunities. Thank you, Monroe County Humane Association. Next, we'll hear from Indiana Recovery Alliance. Hi, my name is Nick Voiles and I'm the syringe service program manager at the Indiana Recovery Alliance and we meet people where they're at. The Indiana Recovery Alliance was founded in 2014 as a response to the death of a local person experiencing homelessness. We began as a bike outreach service, but we quickly added harm reduction materials and services to empower the most vulnerable community members to mitigate negative health consequences associated with IV drug use. As the IRA developed into a formal nonprofit organization, it remained a priority that at every level, the IRA was advised by, staffed by, and taken care of with people with lived experience to ensure that the services we provided reflect the needs of the community we served. The Indiana Recovery Alliance operates under the philosophy of harm reduction to educate the community and to promote the health and dignity of the individuals and communities impacted by drug use. We respectfully collaborate with people to assist in any positive change as a person defines it for themselves, beginning where the person is at with no biases or condemnation for the person's chosen lifestyles. Our efforts advance policies, practices, and programs that address the adverse effects of drug use, including overdose, HIV, hepatitis C, addiction, and incarceration. We're most excited this year about the development of our Advocacy Leadership Academy, which will educate people who use drugs about HCV, mood, or sometimes known as MAT, and their rights as they navigate medical systems, behavioral health, and social services. As part of our community education initiative for IRA participants and community volunteers, we are requesting Sophia Travis grant program funds to support our Sharps Disposal Box Dispersal and Education Program, which will help ensure people have safe and secure places to dispose of Sharps and reduce syringe litter in the community. We appreciate your ongoing support of the program and the years that you've helped us. Thank you. Thank you, Indiana Recovery Alliance. You're welcome. Presenting next will be New Hope for Families. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Emily Pike and I'm the Executive Director of New Hope for Families. Thanks so much for letting us be here this evening and thanks for all your support in the past. Um, as you guys all know, New Hope is a resource for families impacted by homelessness in our community. We are the only family shelter in our region. Uh, and we serve families as they self-define, which means we serve single moms, single dads, married couples, unmarried couples, same-sex couples, custodial grandparents, transgender parents, and just about anybody else you can think of who has a kid. Um, so that's what we do at New Hope, and we have been doing a lot of it for the past 18 months or so. Uh, in the 12 months following the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, we served 80% more families than usual. And we don't anticipate that that's going to decrease. We heard another presenter talk earlier about the lagged effects uh, that a recession has on homelessness. So I won't repeat those stats. Thanks, Forrest, for doing that. Uh, <laughs> and we are anticipating continuing to see an increased demand uh, for several months, probably up to, up to a year and a half or even two years from now if, 
if national data holds for what it's been like in the past. So right now, for example, our capacity in our building is seven families at a time, uh, and we sheltered 11 families last night. Uh, so we anticipate that that's going to continue. We have, uh, we follow what's called a housing first model. And that means that we know that housing is the only solution for homelessness, right? It's right there in the word, it's a home. Uh, and that's something that we're dedicated to at New Hope. So what that means is we wanna do whatever is necessary to get families into a sustainable home. Uh, and what we're asking for is your support in some small ways to do that. Um, sometimes the thing that's holding a family up for several weeks is that they don't have $40 for their application fee for their new place or they don't have $75 to buy a pair of steel-toed boots or non-slip black shoes or something like that that they need for work if they have the opportunity to work. And we wanna make sure that as soon as a family has an opportunity to move into a stable and sustainable home, they're able to do that. And so the way that we accomplish that is by helping families with these small items, birth certificates, uh, prescriptions, uh, application fees, when there aren't other resources available. So we're, we're requesting uh, $9,000 uh, and we anticipate that we'll be able to help 50 families with that investment next year. Thank you. Thank you. New Hope for Families. Uh, our final group tonight will be Youth First and the Bloomington Project School. And now we will hear from Susie's place. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, good evening. My name is Kelly Hunkler and I'm a forensic interviewer here at Susie's Place Child Advocacy Center here in Bloomington. Susie's Place conducts forensic interviews of children whenever there's been an allegation of abuse or neglect. Kids come here to see us here at the center because something's being actively investigated by law enforcement, DCS, or the prosecutor's office. In addition to providing forensic interviews, we also house a medical program we partner with IU Health Riley Physicians to have our medical clinic here to do pediatric sexual assault exams on children that are 14 and younger. Um, prior to having that medical clinic here at Susie's Place, children and families had to go to Indianapolis up to Center of Hope for that specialized pediatric sexual assault exam. So here at Susie's Place, we offer that exam free of charge to families um, for kids that have been here for that forensic interview. Susie's Place is asking for funding for furniture for three key areas within the center. Um, first, we're asking for $1,000 for a new wipeable couch for our family waiting room. Our current couch is over five years old. Um, it's worn out. Um, during the COVID um, epidemic last year, we had to have the couch professionally cleaned every quarter as well as after um, every interview that we did here at the center to prevent the um, COVID spread. So we clean that after every interview as well. So it's got some wear and tear. So we're asking for $1,000 for that new wipeable couch for the family waiting room. Secondly, we're asking for funding for $2,000 for our medical meeting room. Medical staff meet with families and children before and after the forensic interviews after that pediatric sexual assault is completed here at the center. Um, the meeting room is currently unfurnished. We're asking for funding of $2,000 to complete the room with a desk and three chairs. Lastly, we're asking for $2,000 for funding for our team room. All of our interviews here at the center are observed by law enforcement DCS and the prosecutor's office through what we refer to as our team room. Um, we're asking for a new table and five executive chairs for our law enforcement DCS and prosecutor's office to sit in. Um, so all in all, we're asking for funding um, of $5,000 for furniture for these three key areas within the center. Um, thank you very much for all you do and, and we very much appreciate it. Thank you, Susie's Place. Let's hear now from Writing for Change. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, my name is Amy Cornell and I represent the Writing for Change Foundation of Bloomington. We are an affiliate of a nationwide network of writing schools, commonly known as Women Writing for a Change and Young Women Writing for a Change. We provide opportunities for individuals to craft more conscious lives through the art of writing and the practices of community. Writers in our creative writing circles find a welcoming, safe community for self-expression, discovery, and meaningful connection. 
Programs include classes, workshops, and retreats. We do extensive outreach to women in the community by serving at the Monroe County Correction Center, Middleway House, with CASA volunteers, and other social service organizations, many of which we've heard from tonight. In addition to our women's programming, we hold a robust set of classes and summer camps for girls and teens. As many know, between the ages of nine and 13, research shows that girls typically begin to lose their voices. They stop speaking up, taking leadership roles, or offering insight and opinions. Our girls programs seek to be an antidote for this phenomenon. This year, we are asking for a Sophia Travis grant of $3,000 to help subsidize the cost of two week-long girls summer camps for the summer of 2022. The money will be specifically spent to be able to invite any girl to participate, regardless of ability to pay. Summer camps can be expensive to run because of our commitment to each girl's safety. We keep the camps small and we have a four to one camper to facilitator ratio. Each facilitator is carefully trained and vetted to make sure all campers get a quality experience and parents can be assured that their daughters are safe and able to explore the art of writing and voice. Last year, just before the pandemic shut everything down, the Writing for a Change Foundation moved their organization to New Wings, the facility owned by Middleway House. Our move was an attempt to serve more at-risk girls and youth and be close to the social service safety net with which we work closely. This past summer, we were able to hold just one in-person camp and we'd like to increase that to two for summer 2022. Our goal is to eventually have camps for middle school girls as well as late elementary girls. We have received Sophia Travis grants in the past to help us with our girls and teen programming, and we are very grateful for those. We appreciate your consideration for grant for the summer of 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Writing for a Change. We'll hear now from South Central Community Action Program. Thank you so much. I'm Linda Patton. I'm the uh, coordinator for SCAP's Thriving Connections Group. Uh, you've helped us a lot in the past. Sophia Travis funded our last training with our new group of captains. We use a ship analogy for our folks that are moving out of poverty. Uh, they're captaining their ship and learning how to navigate rough waters and what to do if there are pirates or rats on board. Um, so we have, a, we have a good time with that analogy and we create um, uh, goals in the areas of education, sustainable employment, and personal growth. And you um, funded that last group of captains that ended up being totally virtual training. Uh, and we had a very successful one. It was not without challenges as all of us have had this past year, uh, but we came up with some really cool programs, uh, story buddies to support our children, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Zoom programming about all kinds of issues, including racial justice. Um, and we've continued to build community and networks, which is at the foundation of what Thriving Connections is. Um, with living in poverty is hard on your health. Uh, we all know that. We've heard from several people about that, your mental health, your physical health. In the last year, we lost two of our captains uh, to health-related death and we've created a fund to honor them. We always wanna do something. Uh, that's what our community does. And some of the health goals that are supported, we're asking for support from Sophia Travis for. Uh, we've always encouraged and addressed health goals. Um, this grant will allow us to increase our current supports, um, such as buying over-the-counter medications. If you need like a, a, a leg wrap or something that insurance doesn't pay for, We've done nutrition programming forever. We partner with the plant truck to learn how to do bucket gardening. Uh, we've had a lot of programs to increase physical activity, including uh, uh, Roomba uh, dancing type things that were really step dancing. Um, and, and we've uh, increased our mental health support, including um, not just personal counseling, but the opportunity to learn about meditation and learn how to control your anxiety and address the ACEs of your life and trauma. Um, we're adding incentives to that to have some family fun also. And we'd really appreciate the help of Sophia Travis as we broaden our support, health supports based on input from our community members. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the other groups for everything we've done the last year. Aren't we amazing? We are. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, South Central CAP. 
The next presentation will be by Youth First. Hello, good evening. My name is Becky Jesmer. I am the Youth First Regional Development Officer. I live in and support our work within Monroe County. Thank you for having us this evening. And Youth First respectfully requests $5,000 from the Sophia Travis Community Service Grant Committee to support specialized mentoring services at Edgewood Junior High School for the upcoming 21-22 school year. Youth First was founded in 1998 with a mission to strengthen and youth in, strengthen youth and families by providing evidence-based programs that prevent substance abuse, promote healthy behaviors, and maximize student success. With a vision of communities supporting healthy, safe, and successful youth and families, Youth First was born. Youth First serves 12 counties within South Central Indiana, partnering with schools to provide master level social workers with the skills and training to tackle challenges and provide prevention tools that our young, gen our young generations need, all free of charge. In the 2019-2020 school year, Youth First served over 25,000 kids with one-on-one -on -one services with our partnering schools. One of those partnering schools is Richland Bean Blossom here in Ellettsville. Going into our third year at Edgewood Junior High, Youth First social worker, Jesse Laughlin, <clears throat> excuse me, has created, <clears throat> excuse me, has created a significant impact within the school she calls home. With educational pre uh, presentations, Jessie has impacted over 600 students and had 48 kids on her one-on-one -on -one caseload services. Youth First social workers are trained in prevention. They are proactive and responsive to the needs of their schools and are able to meet folks where they are at. Students and families who take hold of behavioral strategies offered by Jessie are equipped with these skills for life. One Edgewood student struggling with severe school anxiety, which became school refusal, worked with Jesse over an eight week period to help change a negative mindset and self-defeating negative thoughts. And one day the work came together and the student said, I can. These, these two short words became the student's touchstone going forward. Youth first exists to transform and strengthen the lives of young people and their families. As we are all aware, the pandemic has brought additional emotional pressures and challenges. Youth first suicide assess assessments were up over 40% across our footprint, footprint, indicating the need for youth first work. Research tells us the presence of one caring adult like Jessie can make a difference in the life of a child. She is a specialized mentor who is readily available to assess, address uh, the needs of family schools and schools. The benefit of working with a Youth First social worker is a stronger, better, healthier community to which we live, work, and raise a family. A Sophia Travis gift and partnership will support more moments within Monroe County. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Youth First. Next, we'll hear from Bloomington Project School. This is last but certainly not least. Do we need to have someone on mute? I sent the request to unmute, but they he did hit it. Don't Hello, worry. can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Now we oh, can. I'm so sorry. I had headphones in that were not um, cooperating with me. Um, thanks for having me. My name's Terry Banks. Um, I'm one of the found co-founders of the Project School. Um, I'm also a middle on the middle school teaching team, and I'm an assistant school leader there. The Project School is a K through eight public charter school. Um, we serve nearly 350 kids this year. Um, we are committed to engaging kids in project, problem, and place-based learning. That's focused on addressing um, issues of social, economic, and environmental sustainability. Um, the project that I'm bringing to this group is called Project Place. Um, the project was born in during the 2019-2020 school year, but put on hold because of the pandemic last spring. Um, we re res resurrected it this past spring um, and finished just a really hard year with the project. Um, it's a partnership with Habitat for Humanity and Lornwood Builders. 
to build um, freestanding uh, auxiliary structures for folks who are newly in Habitat for Humanity homes. So these could be backyard sheds, studios, um, um, any kind of auxiliary dwelling that will help the family um, achieve their, uh, their needs. Um, our kids work hand in hand with, with the clients. We focus on user-centered design, um, work them through the design process. So they're meeting with Habitat for Humanity families um, to hear what they're hoping to get out of the structure. All the labor and design work is, um, is provided on a volunteer basis from Habitat for Humanity and Lauren Wood. Um, this past spring, we, were, we built four structures. Um, we're actually still painting two of the doors, so we're almost there. Um, we learned a lot about um, what we need to do, what, what to do differently, um, the kind of tools we need. Um, so we're just, we're really excited for um, Project Place 2.0. And um, so this grant would allow us, would guarantee that we can build three sheds and buy one set of tools that would um, be a freestanding set of tools for um, site, for the, for the site crew to build, um, which would help us continue to do this year after year. Habitat for Humanity also provides $800 per shed um, for each family that we work with. And like I said, all of the, the Lauren Wood provides the design services and on-site site management um, help. Um, so we're really excited. Um, $10,000 is what we're asking for, which would guarantee three sheds and a set of tools. And um, yeah, we think it's a great project. Um, our kids engage in learning not only about how to work with clients, um, they learn about Habitat for Humanity as an organization and um, housing and how um, difficult it is for families to get into the housing market to own their own homes. Um, and probably more than anything, they get to know these families really deeply and provide something that's real, it's authentic, it's tangible. Um, and it's just such a great experience for everyone. And I'm just going to close by saying I'm so glad I was the last one because I got to hear all of these these presentations and I'm just humbled. Um, and I want our kids to know about all this work and hopefully get involved in some of it. So it, it was a kind of a fortunate accident that I got to go last and just hear all of it. So just thanks for the platform. Thank you, Project School. And thank you uh, to TSD for bringing forth this program. We couldn't do it without you. And thank you to the council office staff who have been uh, amazing in putting together the information for this program, for this uh, program. And certainly, thank you to all the presenters. We're very happy to hear from you. And I can just tell you from my own experience, reading uh, reading applications is one thing, and hearing directly from the applicants is very helpful. So on behalf of the committee, uh, who I also thank for their work, good night to everyone and check out this video on CATS when it's available. If you wish to see more about the community services work that is going on in Monroe County. Good night, everyone.